Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak today. And I'll be talking with you about small cell lung cancer, I think an area where we've seen some interesting data recently that I hope will begin to improve uh, outcomes for this, this patient population with such a difficult diagnosis. Uh, so these are my disclosures. So small cell for a long time has been quite stagnant in the advanced stage setting. You know, we had the advent of platinum atoposide-based chemotherapy in the 1990s, and then for several decades, treatment did not change very much. And these patients would respond to their first-line chemo, they would relapse, and they do very poorly. And I think we saw this again and again in clinic. In 2019, we saw the advent of chemoimmunotherapy for small cell, and this has improved survival for these patients. We'll talk about that data in a moment. That's been our most recent big advance when we think about how to improve outcomes for our patients with a new small cell lung cancer diagnosis. Of course, the question remains, what's coming next in small cell? So I'm going to talk a bit about existing treatment strategies and then speculate a little bit about what's coming, what's shown some positive data in recent clinical trials. Uh, so first talking, though, about platinum atoposide and the era of immunotherapy for small cell. You know, we've seen the data just, uh, just now in our lovely prior talk in non-small cell lung cancer. So what is immunotherapy doing for small cell? Uh, and this has become our kind of standard of care first-line treatment strategy for this disease uh, based on two parallel clinical trials, the EMPOWER-133 study and the Caspian study. And these both had a very similar design, uh, comparing adding uh, a checkpoint inhibitor targeting the PD, PD-L1 axis to the atoposide platinum uh, backbone, uh, followed by immunotherapy maintenance. And you can see the two trials next to each other there showing overall very similar outcomes. And the most important point here is that we saw improvements in overall survival. And as you'll see in some of the next slides we'll look at, clinical trials showing improved overall survival in small cell are unfortunately fairly far and few in between. And very producible, improving survival by a few months for this patient population. Uh, this is also really important information because we know immunotherapy has been looked at in the second line and later setting for small cell where the outcomes are not as good. Um, it's been looked at as monotherapy strategies, as CTLA-4, pd one combination strategies. We weren't seeing the same improvements in survival. We did see responses, and in fact, these drugs, many of them had single agent later line approvals or accelerated approvals for, for small cell um, based on response rates. But unfortunately, when there was a lack of uh, improved survival long term, we don't see those indications anymore. So the NCCN guidelines include them still. You can still give them to your patients if for some reason they missed out on immunotherapy first line. But the best way to give this is combined with chemo up front. And it's really important to get patients access to this if possible. Uh, so what the NCCN says, you know, looking at what happens when this regimen stops working. So we know small cell lung cancer patients will always eventually relapse. And that may happen very quickly within a few months. It may happen after six plus months. And our management for that is quite different. And this is actually a very recent update in the NCCN guidelines, that would be version 1 2023, um, which now basically says that it's been three to six months or more since your original platinum doublet. You can try retreating again. And if it's been longer, you want to think about one of these other recommended regimens. Uh, and the two that have FDA approvals right now are Topotecan and Merbenectidin. So I'll focus a little more on both of those uh, here. So first, why do we do platinum retreatment in small cell lung cancer? There have been a number of clinical trials looking at what's the optimal way to treat these patients in the relapsed or refractory setting. Uh, this is a nice randomized study which helps to explain why we do that three to six month plus window. Um, this took patients who had received the platinum doublet you know, gave them their chemo-free chemo -free interval, monitored them on scans. And if they had at least three months before their relapse, randomized them to either retreatment with the original platinum doublet, this is before the age of immunotherapy, uh, or randomized them to get topotecan, kind of standard, standard second-line chemo. And what you'll see here, a couple important things. Um, one, you see that retreatment improved progression-free survival in all these patients on average, um, but it did not improve overall survival. Uh, and if you look in the subgroup analysis, you can see that what's really going on here is that patients who had at least a six-month interval were doing a lot better, and they were the ones driving the PFS benefit. And the patients with only three to six months de degrees uh, control really didn't do as well. And that's what's led to our current guidelines saying ideally at least six months, maybe at three to six months you consider retreating. Um, but what about when you can't do a platinum doublet again? So we have two options really that are most commonly used these days. Um, one is topotecan. Uh, and this is based on a couple randomized studies, topotecan versus placebo, topotecan versus CAV, which is an older uh, combination chemotherapy regimen. Uh, and you can see that overall survival curve is not as impressive. This is topotecan versus CAV in the second line setting for expensive stage small cell. And really response rates are very similar, 24% in this study. 
Overall survival was very similar as well, about 25 weeks. And its approval was probably based on it improved symptoms better than CAV. So it was better tolerated and patients did better on treatment even though survival and response rates were similar. Um, we know Topotecan has some issues. It has a lot of cytopenias. If you've used this drug, you'll see a lot of thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, anemia. Uh, although it's still often a, a go-to second-line option for our patients. Uh, now, the other option we have approved second line right now for extensive stage small cell is, is uh, lerbonectidin. This was approved about a year ago for small cell lung cancer. Uh, and this is actually based on a single arm study. So we don't have randomized data in this space for lerbonectidin. This looked at patients uh, uh, with relapsed small cell uh, without CNS involvement. So a little unusual population. Small cell lung cancer, you know, patients very commonly have a lot of CNS disease. Uh, and uh, it's a little different. Uh, we saw response rates of 35%, similar PFS, but less cytopenias. Uh, and now we have this drug available as well for patients without CNS involvement. Um, so the question is, you know, what to do in this situation? And I will say, in the second line setting, in a patient who can't get a second platinum doublet, you know, we're usually choosing between either topotecan or lerbonectidin, and then moving on to one of these other agents on this, this very long list of possible single line agents that have some data. Uh, you know, topotecan is what's called a campidothecan, uh, and um, arinotecan falls into that category as well. And I will say I will often reach for arinotecan instead. Um, it's on this list, though not, not at the top of the list, um, just because of better tolerability. Uh, but maybe more interesting is maybe what's coming next in small cell, especially in relapsed refractory small cell, because our options there are really not satisfactory. You might give your arinotecan or your topotecan, your arinotecan, when you're going to pacotaxel, temozolomide, but you're running out of active options. So this is a highly non-scientific survey that I did just in the days before this conference looking at clinicaltrials.gov. What are we doing in clinical trials for small cell in this patient population? Uh, and uh, first things that stand out here, one, there's a lot more non-small cell trials than small cell trials, which is fair. This is a smaller patient population. These patients get sick very quickly. They're hard to study. They're often not going on to third and fourth and fifth line trials like you see in non-small cell lung cancer. Um, but there has been an uptick. I think that reflects what I've seen in the published literature and in conferences. We're seeing more novel strategies being used in small cell as well. So in 2015, there were 35 small cell lung cancer studies that were first listed. And in 2021, 96 studies. So we're seeing uptrend, uh, which I think suggests maybe there is increased interest and progress for small cell as well. So what are some of these studies that have had positive data uh, in, the last, uh, in the last years? And many of these are from just World Lung and ESMO this last summer, so very new data. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three possible novel therapeutic strategies in small cell that are being studied, um, DL3 targeted therapy, um, VEGF targeted therapy, and PARF inhibitors. Uh, and DL3, this is a cell surface target which is overexpressed on neuroendocrine cancers and very selective versus normal tissue. If you were following the literature around 2018, 2019, you know the story of Rova-T, um, but in case you're not, I'm going to take you through it because it's a bit of a cautionary ta tale, I think, in, in drugs. Um, this was a DLL3 targeted ADC, so antibody drug conjugate, uh, which showed some really interesting, promising phase one data, especially for DL3 overexpressing small cell lung cancer. Response rate 38%. That's quite good in a re relapsed refractory population. Led to a lot of additional studies. We had a Robot maintenance after platinum doublet. We had Robot versus Topotecan. Uh, and we had uh, a phase two study kind of in a larger population looking in the DLL3 positive group. And unfortunately, these Subsequent studies all came up negative or closed early because of issues with activity and issues with toxicity. Um, and you know, the question is, is it a problem with DLL3 as a target or is it just an issue with the drug? And I think we all hope it was just an issue with the drug. Um, it had some features that are different than a lot of our modern ADCs that we've seen being used in, say, breast cancer and lung cancer these days in terms of the nature of the payload, the nature of the linker to the payload, and the, the ratio of the drug to the antibody in the drug, uh, in, the, in the compound. Um, but DL3 is still being looked at as a target. And there was some really interesting data just in this last uh, summer at World Lung looking at using DLL3 as an immunotherapy strategy for small cells. So looking at a DLL3 uh, CD3 bite uh, terlotinab, which I really can't say, but uh, <laughs> intended to trigger anti tumor T cell activity. Uh, this is a first in human study, uh, looked at. Uh, safety as a primary endpoint. The idea is to draw CD3 positive expressing T cells to the small cell lung cancer cells which are expressing DLL3 on their surface and trigger that anti-small cell immune response. And this was a positive study in that the drug appeared to have activity, so response rate 23%, and here's the waterfall plot shown there. 
Uh, and uh, this has led to interest, again, in thinking about can we, number one, target DL3, and number two, can we use immunotherapy in novel ways for small cell um, beyond our traditional checkpoint inhibitor strategies? Uh, and you know, safety was overall acceptable, especially when you think about the, the history of DLL3 targeted ADCs. I think only 4% of patients had to stop because of toxicity. Uh, so PARP inhibitors is the other story, I think, right now in small cell lung cancer. Uh, and the rationale for this is you know, in small cell, if you do profile it, you see a lot of P53 and RB1 mutations. And these are all involved in the DNA damage repair response. Uh, and uh, in other settings like ovarian cancer, if you practice in that space, we use PARP inhibitors or we used to use PARP inhibitors uh, in that setting. Uh, and there was interest in saying, can we use these in small cell lung cancer as well? Um, so this was another relapsed refractory small cell patient population. This is also brand new data from World Lung Cancer this summer, uh, showing response rate just shy of 40% if you gave a patient the PARP inhibitor tilazoprib combined with temozolomide, another one of the later line single agent chemotherapy options. And you can see the waterfall part there as well. And that's really quite good, again, for a small cell population. You don't see a lot of 40% response rates. Now, we don't have PFS data from this study, and I think I'd be interested to see it. Um, we have an older study looking at a similar sort of strategy, adding a different PARP inhibitor, Velaparib, to temozolomide backbone, which was a randomized study versus uh, temozolomide alone. And here you saw a similar response rate. I think it was 49%. I think it was very 39%, very similar, similar waterfall plot, but no progression-free survival advantage. So I don't yet know from the other study we'll, we'll see as progression-free survival, but um, maybe sounds a little bit of a, a cautionary note. Now, this is for the overall patient population, and the study got interesting. They looked at biomarkers in small cell. Now, in non-small cell lung cancer, we just heard a lot about biomarkers. You have genomics, you have pd one IHC, uh, you have a lot of markers you can use to give more personalized treatment therapy strategies. Small cell lung cancer, especially in the relapsed refractory setting, has often been a one-size-fits-all, where you're not so much talking about biomarkers for efficacy, you're talking about toxicity and, and side effect profiles. Um, so this study tried looking at a biomarker for response to PARP inhibitors, and they looked at this thing called Schlafen 11 IHC, which is a regulator of the DNA damage response. It's been shown in the past to potentially predict a response to PARP inhibitors in other settings. So they looked at it here in a retrospective fashion in this study, and they showed that patients who were Schlafen 11 positive had both improved progression-free survival and overall survival when they had a PARP inhibitor added to their treatment. Uh, so again, positive overall survival using this retrospective biomarker. Uh, now this needs confirmation in the prospective setting, uh, but again, personalized therapy in small cells, few and far between, so interesting to see happening. Uh, now, one final strategy here in small cell that's currently in clinical trials, though not yet in the clinic, is targeting VEGF. And this is a study I'd like to highlight in Enlotinib, which is a multi-kinase inhibitor looking at VEGF receptor, PGFR receptor, FGFR receptor inhibition. And rationale for this came from uh, prior data suggesting that high VEGF levels might be associated with poor outcomes. So if you can modify angiogenesis, can you improve responses in small cells as well? Uh, this was a placebo randomized study, so in Lotinum versus placebo, uh, looking at progression-free survival as an endpoint. And this study was unusual. A couple things should stand out here, or do stand out here. First, look at the response rate at the bottom at the very uh, the blue box on the slide, response rate of only 4.9%. Patients are not having traditional resist responses to this drug for small cell lung cancer. Uh, so if you looked at that alone, you'd say this was not an active therapy and you would move on. But when you look at the rest of the data, it shows a different story. So disease control rate, 71% versus 13% for placebo. So these patients are having stabilization of their disease, if not objective regressions. And that translated to improvements in progression-free survival, four months versus less than a month, uh, and improvements in overall survival, seven months versus four months. So if you could stabilize these patients' disease, they were doing better, even if you weren't getting objective responses. And a lot of drugs, if you look at them, their initial endpoint, you're looking at a response rate to decide if the drug is worth further development. Uh, so this is interesting data and maybe useful for our patients with maybe lower burden disease, less symptomatic disease, who simply need stabilization. Now, none of these strategies have approvals right now for small cell. They all need prospective studies. They all need larger studies. But um, all showing positive data, including some positive survival data in an entity that often does not have that kind of outcome in clinical trials.
Uh, so what about molecular profiling in small cell lung cancer? In non-small cell lung cancer, we do this for almost all of our patients now, not just in the metastatic setting, but often in earlier stage disease as well. And can this play a role in small cell lung cancer to further subgroup our patients? Maybe the problem is simply that we're treating small cells one disease instead of many different diseases, and that's why we're getting poor responses to therapy. You know, genomic profiling in small cell has not been fruitful to identify you know, individual actionable tar targets like we see in non-small cell lung cancer. But what about transcriptional profiling? A number of groups are looking at gene expression profiles to try to say, can we identify buckets of different types of small cell that appear to be behaving differently, even if under the microscope they have a similar appearance? Uh, and this group, for example, identified subgroups that um, had you know, small cell N, A, P, and I. And the small cell I were those who were more inflamed appearing at the genetic level, at the transcriptional level, and perhaps might have better responses to immunotherapy. They also posited in preclinical data that maybe you could also use PARP inhibitors for one of these groups or other apoptosis inhibitors for one of these groups. So the idea is could you uh, break down small cell into many diseases and then treat each disease in an individual fashion? Again, all in the preclinical setting, but I hope this sort of more personalized strategy will improve our, our responses and our outcomes for these patients in the clinic in the future. Uh, so my takeaways here, you know, chemoimmunotherapy really is the standard of care for newly diagnosed extensive stage small cell lung cancer. This is where you're going to get an improvement in survival, and it's critical to make sure patients get access to these drugs when they're first diagnosed. Um, in the second line setting, really are probably our top three options right now are platinum doublet, verbenectidin, or campothecan um, retreatment, uh, depending on your preferences and duration of disease control. But there are a lot of novel emerging strategies that I hope will offer potentially even non-chemotherapy treatment options for these patients in the future. And with that, thank you, everyone. I should say happy to take any questions. Great. All right. Well, yes, thank you, you very much. All of this. Yes. <laughs>